I will turn it over to Quasi, who's going to introduce uh, today's student invited speaker. Thanks, Michael. So, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, one of this year's MBZ student invited speakers. So, every year, the uh, MBZ graduate student body nominates uh, a set of speakers that we feel are um, leaders in the field of organismal vertebrate biology in some way. And so, one of our speakers that we ended up all voting on was uh, Daniel Bloomstein. And so Daniel Bloomstein is a leader in the field of behavioral ecology. Um, to say that his research record is prolific is a gross understatement. I did a kind of a cursory glance on Google Scholar this morning, and there were exactly 517 entries. Um, I don't think those all represent unique publications, but still, even if only half of publications, that's pretty wild. Um, so Dan did his undergrad at uh, UC Boulder, or University of Colorado Boulder, and then went over to Davis to do a master's that turned into a PhD with uh, Judy Stamps. Um, he then um, did a series of postdocs in various locations around the world um, before joining the faculty at uh, the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, Dan's research program is super diverse, um, all within the broad umbrella of behavioral ecology, but kind of one of the, the shining stars of his program is this long-term study that in 2001 he took over from Ken Armitage out of Kansas on the population biology and social behavior of yellow bellied marmots in the Rocky Mountain, in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado, specifically at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, Laboratory in Gothic. Um, this uh, this long-term study, uh, these marmots have been studied in some capacity since 1962. Um, you know, there's quibbles about what the longest um, behavioral study is, but this is definitely one of the a top contender for that, um, going on 50 years plus now. Um, there, with this system, Dan and his colleagues have uh, looked at a variety of different questions, um, ranging from social behavior, anti-predator behavior, the ecology of fear, and also global change biology, how populations are responding to, uh, to a change in shift in climate. Um, along with the marmots, though, Dan's uh, interests are super diverse, and he's looked at um, small mammals in Australia, um, and amongst a bunch of other systems as well, uh, birds and white crown sparrows um, come to mind. Uh, on top of just kind of straightforward empirical studies of behavior and evolution, Dan's also very interested in conservation and how we apply what we understand about animal behavior and ecology to uh, addressing real-world conservation problems whether it be sort of re-establishing uh, re a lot of decimated small mammal communities in, in uh, Australia or consulting with various agencies on <coughs> how best to apply research into um, tackling uh, co management and conservation issues. Um, anyone who knows Dan knows that he's, a, that he's a man of many interests and many talents, and one of those things is he's a really big foodie. So I actually did two summers as a field tech with Dan in Colorado, and one of the things that was always, that happened almost every other week was that Dan, uh, we'd have a lab meeting, we'd talk about things, and Dan would be like, so, dinner party at my house this weekend? <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, and just, he would manage to cook these like five-star meals in his like two-by-two two plywood cabin in the, <laughs> in the foothills of the Colorado Rockies. And this is... And to say that this was like kind of an amazing moment for a undergrad who had never really done research before is pretty, that's, that was a really um, formative experience for me. And it kind of carries through, in, this sort of hospitality carries through in a lot of Dan's, um, how Dan approaches life and approaches research. Um, Dan's written a bunch, on top of his publication record, he's written a ton of books, but one of my favorites um, was this one, is a cookbook he wrote called Eating, His Way, Eating Our Way to Civility. Um, a guidebook for d dinner parties, and basically, it's a guidebook and recipe book about how to throw dinner parties with rich discussion, so people from diverse backgrounds can come together and experience each other, and you know, sort of experience each other's viewpoints. And I think that's a pretty good encapsulation of who Dan is as a person and who he is as a scientist. So, I'll turn it over. Thank you for that lovely introduction. <laughs> 
this is a real honor because, I mean, you know, any student invited talk is really special, and, and one at the MBZ is even more special. And I'm so glad the power's on right now. And we're all here. Oh, I really don't want to have to do this as an interpretive dance, but I will if, if you press. Um, Quasi could have saved a lot of words by just saying I, I scare shit. And um, what I want to do today is hopefully scare everyone. So this is sort of a Halloween talk on the sound of fear. And, and really, what I want to address and, and get everyone thinking about is, you know, what makes sound scary? And what I want to do is describe insights I've gotten from studying mountain marmots in the mountains to studying, you know, film soundtracks in Hollywood um, to, to sort of understand how we can develop a biological understanding of why things scare us. Um, and, and really it's about how we can um, use bio-inspired insights to understand ourselves a little better. So as Quasi said, I study marmots. I studied um, uh, eight of the 15 species of marmots um, that live around the northern hemisphere. I mean, they are only um, circumpolar, but um, I, I've looked at eight of the 15 species. Marmots are large ground squirrels. Um, they're, I, I like to refer to them as charismatic mesofauna. Um, why do you study marmots? Well, because they have an address. They live in burrows. They're diurnal. You can see them. You know, most of them look kind of the same. They live in a variety of different habitats. All of them scream. We all know that we celebrate marmots. We have a holiday about marmots and animal behavior because ground <laughs> are one of the 15 species of marmots. Um, and it's about climate change. It's about, you know, predicting uh, the end of winter. Of course, we um, celebrate them in other ways, um, and we party with marmots. Um, poor Puxatani Phil gets dragged out of his burrow every year um, to, in the middle of the winter. Um, generally, I would say we make fun of marmots in the U.S., but that's not true all around the world because in Zermatt, there's a statue to marmots. I mean, people really, you know, value marmots. Some species are endangered at one point. There were fewer than 30 Vancouver Island marmots left on Earth, and a captive breeding and reintroduction program is clawing that back from the brink of extinction. Pandas, pandas aren't endangered. Vancouver Island marmots are endangered. So, what I want to do today, and some other marmots are now in danger from over harvesting and, and other, um, other issues as well. So what I want to do today is really take a Tinbergian view of alarm calling and think a bit about the evolution and function and causation and meaning of alarm calls. <coughs> I want to then go and shift gears a bit and think about, so there's a lot of gear shifts, no clutch, I talk fast, uh, we'll have fun, put on your seatbelt. I, I want to ask about whether marmots cry wolf and think about individuality and the importance of reliability signaling. And I want to talk about fear screams. Turns out fear screams are not alarm calls. Um, and I want to talk about what I've learned when I almost thought that I broke a baby marmot one day and, and how that's taken me down a whole interesting uh, path towards understanding who we are, really. And then I want to have a Hollywood ending where we go from marmots to, to music because, um, after all, marmots are seasonally active, they're hibernators, and um, I'm in LA during the academic year, and uh, there are no marmots there, but there are a lot of people that make a lot more money than I do, um, <laughs> scaring us. So alarm calls could be directed to predators to signal detection and to discourage pursuit, or they could be directed to con specifics to warn can or to create pandemonium. And much, much, much work has been focused on the conspecific warning function of alarm <coughs> communication. Yet, if you look at the evolutionary origin of alarm communication in rodents, so a former honor student, Aaron Shelley, and I went back and looked at, um, reconstructed the evolution of alarm communication in 209 species of rodents, um, we found that the evolutionary origin of alarm communication was not associated with the evolutionary origin of sociality but rather was associated with the evolutionary origin of diurnality. So at, at nighttime, you know, you don't know where the risks are. And, it's, and, and I find alarm calling animals by listening to the alarm call at me or me and my dog and like, oh, there you are. Um, so do predators, real predators. So animals are calling when they're safe. Just because an animal emits an alarm call doesn't mean it just reflexively emits an alarm call. Animals seem to have volitional control over the situations under which they emit alarm calls. And when you can see the risks around you, you can manage those risks better. So I would say that the uh, initial function of alarm calling was probably directed towards predators. And then later, an exaptive function was potentially this conspecific warning function which is interesting because we put most of our effort into understanding the paradox of why you expose yourself by you know, calling and warning in. Um, we're going to have a little sing-along now. 
um, of yellow belly, of, of, of marmot alarm calls. There are 14 species here, it's an old phylogeny. Um, the marmot I study, Flaviventer, is, used to be called Flaviventris. You've got to change the name on your, on your, on your, uh, on your, on your cabinet here. Um, but, um, but, but what's interesting is when we think about alarm calls in birds, we think about convergence of alarm calls to those seat calls. Aerial predators elicit a particular type of call. Terrestrial predators influence raucous mobbing type calls in many, in many situations. And you expect convergence. This goes back from Peter Marler when he was working here, really, um, was uh, writing about those things. But alarm calls in marmots are incredibly diverse. There's 14 species here. The 15th species is this species that lives within the range of another species in part of the former Soviet Union that has high background levels of natural radiation. <laughs> um, so genomically it's unique, chromosomally it's unique. I don't know what it sounds like. I'm not going and recording it. <laughs> um, but let's listen, let's have a sing-along with these calls. Himalayana. Roughly from the top to the bottom. Siberica. Kamchatka. Bapacina. Bobag. Caudata, Menspiri, Browerai, Marmota, normal, and then start high, Monax. That's the groundhog. Olympus, an ascending, a descending, a flat, and a trill. Caligata, an ascending, a descending, a flat, and a trill. Vancouverensis, ascending, descending, flat, kiaw, trill. Flavaventris, a whistle, and then a trill. You can hear the dog that elicited that trill. <laughs> um, so, you know, really diverse. So what, what can we learn from this? And in a suite of studies that I'm not going to go into today, more socially complex marmots <coughs> and ground squirrels and prairie dogs produce more call types. Um, the acoustic environment doesn't explain repertoire size variation in, in four or five species of marmots that we looked at. The number of predators a species has doesn't seem to account for the difference in the number of call types. And that when you start looking at, if you sort of argue by analogy and look at squirrels that have been isolated on islands for, um, you know, a thousand or more years, you begin seeing divergence in the call structure. And I suspect that um, these differences um, largely come about by drift because I can't find a functional, you know, sort of you know, reason for these differences. Um, interestingly, marmots don't seem to listen to other species' calls or respond to them. So. Um, it is what it is. These are, you know, these these calls you don't hear every day. They're not used in other social contexts. They're they really are alarm calls elicited by predators. They're not seemingly used in sexual selection contexts. So it's kind of interesting. Um, I want to focus now and drill down a bit and go from comparative to really begin focusing on one species of marmot before we sort of draw back and look at lots of different taxa and think about the marmots of the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. So in terms of long-term studies of individually marked mammals, at least, Jane Goodall started in 1961. Um, Ken Armitage started in 1962. Um, you know, Jane, of course, studies uh, chimp studied chimpanzees in the Gombe. Um, Ken started this long, what turned out to be a long-term study of marmots at the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. It's become a window on climate change and the demography of <coughs> population biology in, in, in many aspects. And um, when I sort of took over running it in 2001, I worked there as a postdoc a little bit. But when I started running it in 2001, I did a lot more focusing on any predator behavior and social behavior and communication. And today I want to talk to you about some of the stuff, um, insights from the communication studies that, that we did. So I consider it um, uh, a heavy responsibility to study animals and live trap them and interfere with their lives. Because after all, we can't observe a system without interfering with it. So I try to get as much data as I can. So I write down everything that happens when we're trapping animals. I'm collecting feces and other sort of samples whenever I can. And um, one thing that we could ask is, 
what potentiates calls? What, what, what makes it more likely that an animal will call? Just because a predator is walking through doesn't mean that all animals call. Some species, you do have contagious calling, but not yellow-bellied marmots. So when a predator comes through, sometimes animals call, sometimes they don't call. So we capitalized on what I call the trap calling assay, which is when a predator calls, some animals emit alarm calls. When I walk towards animals, kind of the same animals are more likely to give an alarm call. When we trap an animal, those animals are also maybe more likely to give an alarm call. So we trap them all the time, um, and we collect poop, and we can look for fecal glucocorticoid uh, metabolites in those fecal samples. And what we found was for females that were trapped on one occasion when she called, and on adult females on another occasion when she didn't call, we found that when she called, she had systematically higher glucocorticoid metabolite levels than on an occasion when she didn't call, suggesting that um, stress hormones, if you will, potentiate alarm calling, at least in female hormones. Okay, hold that thought, because that explains difference in propensity to call stress levels. And that's interesting because there's information contained in these calls, and if some animals call more than others, that means there's reliability differences in the calls. So just hold that and we'll come back to that later. Alarm calls are interesting because there's a whole cottage industry trying to understand what they mean. When we think about bird song, we typically don't think about <coughs> the meaning of bird song. Birds are singing to propel um, you know, members of their own sex or defend territories, but it's not about you know, what does this mean? They might be calling to attract mates, but the, the level of meaning is a little different. So really because of Peter Marler's group years ago, people started thinking about um, meaning and thinking about um, could these be models for understanding human language. Language has many different attributes. Um, Hockett refers to, I think, 18 attributes of language. One of those attributes is um, referential abilities, the ability to communicate about things outside oneself. Darwin, when Darwin was talking about communication, he was saying that you know, animals have utterances that are associated with their internal state. Yet, um, we know we can refer to laser pointer um, you know, or other things, and we know that some animals can as well. What could alarm calls mean? Well, they could communicate the degree of risk. In this case, the same predator would um, uh, could create different risks in different situations. A coyote very close to me is very different than a coyote far away from me. And that response urgency could call, could drive call <coughs> variation. Calls could be functionally referential. They could um, serve as simple words or labels. Coyote, raptor, coyote, badger. Um, and the degree of that um, functional specificity could um, be communicated in, 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 in these predator-specific alarm vocalizations. And then, you know, in the, the coolest animals on Earth, meerkats, um, they do a bit of both as we do. If I say fire, that means something very different um, in, on, on a, on a, you know, in, a, in a prison yard than it does in a movie theater or around the campfire. So um, we have referential words, and we can also have emotional you know, um, aspects of risk communication in them. You, know, you would say fire in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a movie theater. So how do we do this? We spend a lot of time observing and listening calls. Um, marmots are pretty pucker-faced and don't say much. So we have our armamentaria, fear, robo-badger, eagle Knievel. that's Ken holding eagle Knievel. This is before drones. Um, so we had a radio-controlled glider, and marmots live in, many marmots live in beautiful alpine settings. Alpine settings are characterized by large rocks. You fly a glider, the marmot alarm calls, then you have to somehow land it. Um, and it lands, you know, on large rocks. So those of you who are of a certain age will remember Evil Knievel, who was this nutcase who put himself onto um, rocket-propelled motorcycles, launched himself, attempted to launch himself over various western canyons, and usually hit the other side, broke all his bones. A year later, he's healed, and he's doing it again. Um, so with e Eagle Knievel, um, I would tape him up, spend more time taping him than flying him and gluing him back together again. And as you know, when something gets heavier, it flies faster and crashes more spectacularly. So there's a half-life to these experiments. So after studying all of this, and I started studying this because I got some NIH funding. This was a mistake. NIH had a call for, let's understand the biological basis for you know, what we study, and they study language and human language. And I said, well, some people have said marmots. Some species of marmots have referential word-like communication, and other species I know don't. So let's study the evolution of this. 
And um, if you're a graduate student, don't believe anything you read because this sent me astray. And the short answer is no marmots have functional referential abilities, at least if you adopt um, rigorous criteria. But as a biologist, this is great. Um, I mean, they illustrate a variety of different repertoire sizes, which you've heard, and a variety of different mechanisms by which they communicate risk. Some of them call faster as risk gets bigger, suggesting that um, they're getting more aroused in some sense. Some call more slowly as, or, or have um, less obvious calls. They may package calls, and they become less obvious as risk increases, suggesting that they might be trying to make themselves less conspicuous. Um, the Vancouver Island marmot, which we almost lost, seems to have what we might call phonological syntax, where it's not just the type of call, but the bout composition. You mix them up in different orders, you get different responses. Fascinating. Biodiversity are good. So anyway, no species of referential abilities, but remarkably diverse ways of getting, um, solving a problem, which is communicating risk. So let's drill down into yellow belly marmots. And if you start measuring yellow belly marmot calls and listening to them, um, their calls contain potential information about age, sex, and identity. So why do we, should animals produce individually distinctive vocalizations? And I think we can, in some systems, come up with easy answers for that. You can think about group or territorial calls where, you know, you're sort of saying, I'm defending this territory, um, I sound different than my neighbor, this keeps the whole system going. There's selection on the producer to sound different, there's selection on receivers to respond to those differences. Contact calls, Fred, Mabel, Joey, Sydney, Fred, Mabel, Joey, Sydney. If you're in a group and you're social, you might want to keep track of others around you. Selection on the producer to sound different, selection on the receiver to respond to those differences. If you like to leave your kids and go out you know, to eat, um, you crush your kids like you're a penguin or a marine mammal, um, you got to come back and find your kid. Mom, Junior, Mom, Junior. You know, selection on the receiver, selection on the signaler for both sides of the communication system. What about alarm calls? Remember, many of these animals never say anything. Um, we can always say kinship is important, right? I mean, that's what we do. But really, people are thinking about reliability assessment. And if you think about court levels, you might say that, well, some individuals are nervous Nellies, and other individuals might be cool hand Lucy's. And nervous Nellies might call at the drop of a leaf, and they might be giving what might be considered false alarms. And cool hand Lucy's might be pretty <coughs> on message, but so understanding who that individual is and knowing something about them, developing some idea, some representation about an individual's reliability might be very meaningful. So when I was good and spending a lot of time in the field, I would see predators before marmots about as many times as they would see predators before I saw them. And many times I never see predators, and I'm fairly convinced the marmots never see predators when they call. Sometimes they call the deer. Um, but at the end of the day, I could not, with any certainty, estimate the reliability of callers. But I can manipulate it. I could do a nasty experiment. Um, so what we did was we created a reliable individual. And, and the literature sort of says reliability drives individuality in alarm calls. But I sort of didn't really believe the literature because I thought the experiments weren't really that well done. So I said, I'm going to do the end all experiment. And it's a nasty experiment. What you want to do is you want to create a reliable individual. In this case, we paired the site of Robo Badger, Son Robo, just a badger covered with a tarp, unveiled it when a target marmot came out, hosed the meadow with rapid paste alarm calls for um, 10 minutes, and then you know, shut the whole thing down. On another occasion, we had the badger out there covered with a tarp, hosed the meadow with a series of alarm calls from another individual on one occasion. So this is a learning experiment. We had to pre-test each of our focal individuals. We had to expose them to different um, situations, and then we had to post-test them. And the last thing I want to do, because we really try not to hurt these animals, um, is habituate them to alarm calls. So we're, so then we go and we sort of um, ask, you know, can you discriminate these different calls after sort of habituating them? So in all these cases, when we're, we're testing them, we're asking, we, we bait animals to a central location about a meter away from their burrow. We have a speaker. Um, within about 10 meters that's obstructed in some way. And we have them foraging, and we have a baseline period where they're foraging. And then we broadcast the sound, and we look at whether 
how long it takes them to resume foraging. Foraging is a particularly sensitive assay. They can move, they can look around, they always respond. Sometimes they go underground, sometimes they come back out, but the foraging often is the, the most sensitive assay. So if reliability, if marmots learn about reliability of individuals, should they forage more or less? Oh, I, I, I've got to say something. The reliability story is all about the boy who cried wolf, right? So you remember the boy who cried wolf. He went up to the meadow and, and said, wolf, wolf, and everyone ran up and there was no wolf. So they habituated to him. So all of the previous studies on a variety of different species really supported the boy who cried wolf idea. So if the boy who cried wolf idea predicts the response of marmots to these alarm calls, um, and they learned about reliability, would they forage more or less when they heard calls from a reliable caller? Less. They would forage less. They would, they were exposed, the unreliable caller was unreliable. They should have habituated <coughs> to the unreliable caller, so they should, um, you know, be more scared and forage less after they hear the reliable caller. So we found the exact opposite. Small sample size, didn't want to do this with too many animals, but we found the exact opposite. So I don't believe anything I do, I don't believe anything I read, um, I believe in corpuses of data pointing in the, you know, to point in the same direction. I kind of believe meta-analyses and comparative analyses, but um, many things I don't believe. So the unreliable callers were not ignored. They were, there was no evidence of habituation of anything there. You know. um, it was the opposite. So the first thing we did was we re-extracted all the data and made sure we didn't screw something up in our analysis. And then I said, well, let's, let's look at other lines of evidence and let's do other experiments. So there are three lines of evidence, I think, that reliable individuals are discounted in, in some way. Um, marmots forage more while hearing a caller artificially made reliable. Again, they always look, but then they just went back to foraging. Almost as though they said, yeah, I hear you, but you're usually right. I'm going to go back to foraging. Marmots forage more while hearing undegraded and therefore presumably higher risk calls. So all signals both attenuate and degrade over distance. Attenuation is loss in amplitude, degradation is loss in fidelity. And animals, birds and mammals particularly, are really good at estimating distance by ranging and using degradational cues to do so. So if I'm, you know, next to you and I'm calling and I'm at risk, you might infer that you're at risk because I'm at risk. But if I'm very far away from you, and I'm calling, predator could be by you, or it could be by me, and you're, you're less certain. So animals probably should forage <laughs> less while hearing undegraded calls, but actually they forage more while hearing undegraded calls, and presumably higher risk calls. Animals forage more after hearing calls from older animals who presumably are more reliable. I mean, do you really listen to your kids about threats um, than, than, than from potentially unreliable pups? And this is the exact opposite of what was found in vervet monkeys and bonnet and rhesus macaques and steppe marmots and Richardson ground squirrels. All of those studies found that individuals forage less or look more after <coughs> hearing calls from reliable animals. Exact opposite. So why do marmots seemingly discount calls from reliable individuals? I think that unreliable individuals or situations are unreliable specifically because it's difficult to assess the true risk of predation. Again, they respond to all of these. They just go back and start, you know, they're foraging again. <coughs> Unreliable call situations elicit independent investigation. You don't know what's going on. Uncertainty is everything in communication. And if you have no, nothing, if you have no certainty, you're going to spend more effort uh, assessing those risks. And I think the same way we saw evolutionary flexibility and the mechanisms by which different species of marmots communicate risk, I think we should expect evolutionary flexibility and mechanisms of communication more broadly, and that um, here we're seeing it in how information <coughs> is valued, how reliability is processed in some way. And converts are the worst. I mean, I went into this not believing in reliability assessment, and now I'm, you know, preaching to the world that reliability assessment is everything. Um, it's likely to be a general uh, explanation, I think, for the evolution of the ability to discriminate among alarm callers. But how it plays out, I think, becomes an evolutionary ecological question. I think people need to look at this in other systems and understand well, what makes one mechanism more likely than another? There's got to be something about predictability of information in environments and uncertainty in environments. Nonetheless, I think we can infer that, maybe explain, that um, individual 
animals, that alarm call, reliability assessment is important for many species, and it works in different ways. Now we know that the sound of fear um, can be many things in behavioral ecology or site specific. Many things in life are site specific. I like to talk these days about how context really is everything, and behavioral ecologists are obsessed about context because that's our bread and butter. But the sound of fear also is contextually dependent. In LA or in Berkeley, you know, it might sound something like this. In Gothic, it sounds something like this. And that's the sound of a baby marmot. Um, within about the first nine or ten days of emerging from their natal burrow, they've been in their burrow for three or so weeks, they emerge, and for the first eight or nine, day, nine or ten days, they might give that at some point when you're holding them. And the first time, and I've held thousands of marmots, the first time I had that happen, I almost dropped it. I'm like, oh my god, I broke it. <laughs> and the last thing I want to do is break our animals because we want to study them throughout their lives because population biology studies are a key part of what we're doing. And, but I also had this emotional <clears throat> reaction. And I'm like, I don't have emotional reactions when I hear an animal alarm calling. And I'm like, you know, what's going on? Why am I having this emotional reaction to a little rodent screaming? So when Darwin first came online, this is before the internet, this was when, what was it called? I mean, it was sort of the internet, but it was before Google, it was before the web, it was, um, it was before mail, well, when mail was out there, but it was, but no, you know what, it, 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 gopher, gopher. Go, things, started, things started becoming digitized, and, 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 and you could sort of check, you know, text in ASCII code or whatever. And um, Darwin came online, like, Darwin, did he know marmots? You know? And Darwin did not know marmots, poor Darwin. Um, I don't think Darwin ever saw marmots, Darwin never wrote about marmots, but Darwin knew screams, and he wrote about screams. He said, screams um, are calls for assistance that young animals give to solicit help from older animals. We know that screams are emitted from highly aroused individuals, and the first thing you can ask is, are screams typical alarm calls? And of course, you know by now they aren't. But, you know, let's, let's just go through that line of reasoning for a moment. Alarm calls often have um, simple harmonic structure. So these are calls from two different adult females, and these slight differences, these aren't very long vocalizations, these slight differences are what communicates that individuality that I was talking about before. That makes them individually specific. What about meerkats, the coolest animals on Earth? Meerkats actually have functionally referential calls. They have an, a call that's solicited by an aerial predator, a call that's solicited by a terrestrial predator. But interestingly, as urgency increases, these calls get sort of more degraded. They get noisy. Their structure changes. What's going on with that? How might that be produced? They also have like recruitment calls and high urgency recruitment calls. Um, so. All vocalizations in, in, in mammals are produced when um, animals blow air across um, their larynx, in birds across their syrinx, it vibrates, that vibrates, and the, the, we think of sort of about um, production filter systems that, that, that produce calls. And if you blow too much air over something, or you turn your stereo up too much, um, you end up overblowing a system. Think about your stereo. It's louder, 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 sounds good, sounds good. That system is sort of, this nonlinear system is sort of in its linear state. You turn it up too much, overpower it, it becomes predictably degradable. Our son, for our sins, decided he wanted to learn the trumpet. Um, we live in a townhome in Los Angeles. The trumpet is loud. The learning curve is horrible. <laughs> he got okay at the end. But, um, but, I mean, I can't get a sound out of the trumpet. Um, and, you know, when you're good, you blow and you blow and you blow and it gets louder and louder and louder. At some point, you overblow it. Same thing with overblowing your vocal. The, the system becomes overblown. So non complex nonlinear systems have a point beyond which they're overblown where you can describe that system as becoming nonlinear. And nonlinear, when the system becomes nonlinear, that's really interesting because you have predictable unpredictability. You have what might be called subharmonics. So these are Reese's coup calls where you have bands of energy um, below harmonics. You have side bands, bands of energy is around major bands of energy. You have what might be called deterministic chaos, or what sort of sounds like noise, energy spread across the calls. And as we saw in those meerkat calls, as urgency increased, um, we have what looks like um, a, a, a vocal signature of a system being overblown. We also have warbles, or abrupt frequency shifts, and we also can have um, 
uh, abrupt amplitude shifts as well. Predictable non-predictability. Chaos. Systems become chaotic. So the structure of screams is acoustically convergent, slightly ancestral, because they're produced in the same way by causing systems to vibrate. You overblow uh, uh, your vibratory system, it becomes um, nonlinear. So let's listen to some hunting tapes. These are horrible sounds, um, where people went out and tortured animals to record them so they could then lure in predators. Let's listen to a rabbit. Fox, deer, all of these are chock full of nonlinearities. All of these are vocalizations given, given under duress. All of duress, all of these are screams. So we know the yellow belly marmot alarm calls, they communicate risk by varying the number and rate of their calls. The whistles are the most common call type, um, are individually distinctive. These, this isn't referential in any way. So we studied screams um, by, uh, produced by these pups within about nine or ten days of emergence from the natal burrow. It took a long time to get these. Most marmot pups don't scream. Um, when they do scream, um, you have to drop everything and start trying to record them. By that time, they stop screaming, and you're shaking them, you're trying to record them, and the mother comes out and looks at you, which the mother doesn't do when, you, when they're alarm calling. Um, marmot pups can produce alarm calls the day out of their burrow. Um, they're cute, they're high-pitched, those are normal pup alarm calls, but occasionally they scream, which, you know, a little more shocking. We made a bunch of measurements on screams, looked for evidence of nonlinearities on screams, began finding it. Screams differ from calls on all measured features, right? You know, um, screams are longer duration, um, they're lower frequency than alarm calls. Now that's interesting in its own right because um, typically the lowest frequency you produce is constrained by your body size. If you're big, you can speak low. But if you're small, you can't speak low. So body size, vocalization, low frequency, that relationship is an unbluffable measure of size. Are these little marmots trying to make themselves sound bigger by screaming? I don't know. It's a functional explanation. Screams frequently had deterministic chaos or noise. Um, many had subharmonic. Some had biphonation. Most had warbles. They're highly individualistic. Um, are they more evocative than calls? Well, I sort of gave that away because Sometimes the mothers would come out and look at us, and the mothers have big teeth, and we're sitting down next to their burrows, and they're right next to us, and we're like keeping our fingers away from them. We've never been attacked by a mother. Um, here we did a playback experiment, baited animals to some bait, played them an alarm call, a call from a pup or a pup scream. Um, these are 15 second time bins. They responded to all of them, but, and they recovered more quickly to alarm calls from adults or alarm calls from pups, um, but it took them longer to recover to the, the, the screams and puffs. When I first um, started studying this, the thing that really uh, was, was obvious was that if you think about that chevron-shaped alarm call, um, I went to a school in a time and place where they had chalk and where they had music <laughs> class. And, and you know, where you had chalk and music class, you would get that special tool that they put the chalk on the thing and made the fret or whatever, and, you know, and it would squeak and everyone would squeal. And I figured, well, maybe a call, if it's just sort of elongated, becomes, you know, um, a scream. So I got some software. We came up with an average scream. We could then manipulate that. This is you know, two standard deviations shorter than an average scream. This is two standard deviations longer than an average scream. You know, does scream duration influence? Yeah, it does. Long scream suppressed farging more than short screams or alarm calls. But this isn't just about marmots. Nonlinearities are, I hate to say that, but they're, they're common in highly aroused animals. You know, that rough sound is the sound of an overblown system. Your dog, you know when your dog is happy barking and stress barking and really scared. Um, macaques, um, piglets. I'm not going to do a piglet. Um, <laughs> this gets you into a really dark literature really fast because I like to tell our students who are concerned about animal welfare, which I am um, also, that don't come after you know field biology um, or even lab biology. Go after the food production industry. So there's a lot of people in the food production industry that are trying to figure out whether <coughs> animals are stressed or not, and they're coming up with vocalization cues for that. So the literature you know involves studies like here is the sound of the goat being walked on its way to being castrated. Here is the sound of the goat being castrated. Here is the sound of the goat after it's castrated. So, dark literature. Anyway, um, 
so after reading a bunch of these and thinking about this a bit, you know, I, I want to propose a hypothesis. The sound of fear, or more generally, arousal, may be nonlinear. These nonlinearities may be evocative because they're unpredictable, and this creates an honest signal of fear. So let's do a simple playback experiment. Let's take a really short Mormon alarm call. Let's put a little band of white noise in it, and let's remove a little bit of sound, equal amount of sound. Now I'm going to acknowledge this is nonlinear in the sense that it's an abrupt amplitude um, change and frequency change, but nonetheless, let's put that in. I want you to listen to this, and I want you to listen particularly to the second call, which will sound a little different. A little rougher, right? So calls with noise added, suppressed foraging compared to normal calls or calls with silence. So, you know, we have all these lines of data. I, um, our data are there to be used. Um, I got cocky. Um, I said, well, we have court measures on these calls. You know, the screams are, are animals that are um, calling, producing noisier calls. No, they produce cleaner calls. Um, scared marmot pups produce noisy screams. Scared adult marmots articulate their calls, um, more so for males than for females. So Wiener entropy is a measure of um, noise and fecal corticoid metabolites. So that's interesting. This is almost like the, you know, go ahead, make my day. That when animals are in situations where it's really important to get a message across, you're really scared, maybe you articulate that message better. Um, so maybe these poor articulated calls may help better communicate the desired message. Um, as I said, this is not a story about marmots. Um, Nonlinearities, specifically rapid downshifts um, and noise, decrease relaxed behavior in Caribbean great health practice. So I teach a field course every other year, um, 15 undergrads, we go somewhere, um, and um, I have them in groups of three, they've got to come up with some sort of an experiment, I help them, you know, design these experiments, then I help them execute these experiments, um, many of them are published, um, and here we're working with grackles, and we said, well, what about completely synthetic nonlinearities? So a, a novel control sound, um, a pure tone, completely novel, a pure tone that goes up, a pure tone that goes down, a pure tone followed by noise. And here we're looking at relaxed behavior in the grackles, means 95% confidence intervals, and we find that these upshifts and downshifts, and particularly downshifts in noise, suppress this relaxed behavior. Completely artificial sounds. We did the upshifts and the downshifts because riffing off Darwin, Gene Morton came up with this idea of what are called motivation structure rules, which um, Darwin talked about, you know, appeasement signals, you know, as opposed to aggressive signals. So an upshift might be more appeasement, a downshift might be more aggressive. Both of them are nonlinear. Like crown sparrows too, same thing. Um, jump down, jump up, noise, suppress, um, compared to pure tones. Um, and even in species that don't speak, so in um, uh, uh, a non-vocal skink, we found some evidence that um, the jump down and the noise changed the rates of looking from baseline behavior. So there's something about nonlinearities and noise particularly that seem to be um, innately evocative for many species. So I was giving a popular talk in LA, uh, marmots are hibernating, so I'm talking to like movie people, and I said, I bet this works for music and soundtracks. And the guy comes up with a break and says, I bet you're right. Um, he said, I'm sort of trying to get a PhD, looking at emotional communication in animals, taking a more biological perspective, and I'm a musician and a film score composer. And I'm like, let's collaborate. He's like, okay. Um, so this, now we're going to have the Hollywood ending, um, which we got together, and we got a graduate student, Richard Dobbitton, and we said, okay, well, if this is all true, then maybe we can see um, what look like nonlinearities in specific genres of films at specifically key points to grab our attention, to be more evocative, to be more fearful. So if humans respond like non-humans to nonlinear sounds, then composers and audio engineers can capitalize on this to evoke emotions. So do these evocative you know, soundtracks incorporate noise and non other nonlinear analogs? And I say analogs because this is the result of a 
film score has diagenic or background sound, it has foley or sound effects, it has people speaking, it has people singing, it has people screaming, it has music, it has different instruments. This is not a system in any way, shape, or form, <coughs> but if certain um, sounds in this tapestry of, of, of sound mimic um, or resemble something that might be the product of an overblown system, then maybe we can look for those and see if there are associations. So we use databases um, to find the best war movies, adventure movies, horror movies, dramatic movies, and then we sort of scrutinize spectrograms, argued for a long time, can we even measure this? You know, are we consistent in what we're looking for? <coughs> we, we took, that just took a while. And we, we sort of took the, the scenes that were the, you know, the boat sinking, everyone's crying, the guy's getting walked to be executed in the Green Mile. Um, psycho, you know what the scene that is. Um, <laughs> and, and um, looked at, at, at these spectrograms and, and scrutinized them. <laughs> noisy female scream. Not noisy female scream. Sidebands, all sorts of other things. Again, not produced by overblowing a system, but a tapestry produced by people. Yet, in this tapestry, we can identify things that look like they are nonlinearities if they were produced by, simulated nonlinearities if they were produced by, by people, by, by a normal system. So then we counted the films in these different genres that had what we identified as some of these specific nonlinearities. So then we did some high square tests, and we found that adventure, you know, so black is the number of films that had something, white isn't. And we found that um, sad films have fewer noisy sound effects than you would expect by chance. Okay. Um, sad films have enhanced abrupt musical frequency changes while horror films seemingly suppress them. Okay. Sad films enhance musical sidebands while horror films suppress them. I don't know how to study sadness. <laughs> I know how to study fear. I don't know how to study sadness. I do know that I cry at movies all the time, but I, I don't understand why, biologically. I mean, there's something about those violins, which are sort of sidebands, right? The violas. Horror films use noisy female screams, well, sad films suppress them. Duh. It's, horror. it's not a horror film until there's a woman screaming. So, okay, that's great. Um, this is all um, highly correlative, somewhat subjective. Um, can we do an experiment? So I was talking to a friend, Greg Bryant, um, at UCLA. Greg is in communication studies, and he studies emotional communication and speech. Um, he's also a musician. Um, and I said, Greg, you know, you study emotional communication in, in humans, yeah. You know how to study humans, yeah. Um, you know, you like music, yeah. Um, you have access to people and know, you know, the people pool because Department of Communication Studies has access to people because everything we know about, you know, human psychology comes from undergraduates that have to do things in order to um, get credit in their classes. And he's like, yeah, but you want to collaborate? He's like, yeah. Um, so Peter and Greg, um, created a bunch of music, marmot-inspired music. Um, you cannot go wrong by following the inner marmot. I'll just assert that. And um, what this was was sort of Muzaki sort of stuff. Um, so the Muzaki stuff. These are 10-second clips. So that's a control sound, and we have like a whole bunch of these different genres, different ditties. This goes for five seconds, then something happens. Sounds a little noisy. And we did 10 second clips um, because Peter, this film score composer, said he got a gig with MTV years ago where he made 10 second movies, shift down. Where he said he made 10 second movies. And he goes, you can actually communicate something in 10 seconds that you know, triggers some emotions. So um, those guys are good musicians. We had great music. Um, none of us were good cinematographers. So we went out and we filmed really ben, you know, benign, ban banal, poorly filmed scenes of someone sitting and at five seconds taking a sip out of a cup of coffee or the phone rings and they pick up their phone or they're walking and they make a right turn or they make a left turn or things like that. Something happens at five seconds. And then we pair these in a multimodal experiment and you know, multimodal communication is life. I mean, that's how animals acquire information and communicate. In many cases, it's more than simply screaming. It's, it's that with something else. Um, but we also know that multimodal signals um, are integrated, different modalities are integrated to form a unified um, percept, 
and we know that we have biases in how we integrate those things. So we had potentially alarming music, and we had completely you know, benign visual things. It wasn't like anyone was like stabbing anything. So um, I'm not going to talk about the multimodal results because there isn't anything there. I will say that when we set this thing up, you know, the phone rings, and if you hear the music going along, it's like, yeah, whatever. And you hear the music going down, it's like, oh, no, who died? Um, so I'm like, this is going to work. This is going to work. But it didn't work with the visuals. But it worked, so I'll just focus on the sounds. So what we found was that arousal, and oh, we asked people, how emotionally um, stimulating or evocative do you um, find this sound or multimodal thing? And, and how positive or negative is it? So that gets at arousal and valence. And those are two attributes of emotion. So we found that arousal was enhanced by noise and frequency up, and valence was reduced by noise and frequency downs. Um, we then said, OK, well, let's wire people up. So that, that's experimental evidence, self-reported, but experimental evidence of emotional communication in these, this form of inspired music. Then we wired people up. And I wanted, I made a mistake, and I said, I really want to keep the experiment the same, and let's do it the multimodal way, and let's look for a suite of autonomic responses. But many of the autonomic responses, heart rate, um, galvanic skin response, sweat, um, were sort of poisoned by the onset of this, and we're not working on a time frame where we could look at the rapid changes at five seconds. But we also were looking at muscle movement. So there's a literature out there that, you know, you see something scary, your eyes open up, and your muscles hear fire, your mouth opens up, and your muscles hear fire. And we found that noise leads to enhanced eye muscle movement. So what I'd say from this is composers and sound engineers capitalize on our natural responses to nonlinear um, vocal attributes to evoke, evoke emotions in film soundtracks and maybe music, and that they make a lot more money doing this than, than I do. I, of course, tried to patent this idea because at the time I was department chair and I'm going to all these things about well, how can we you know, claw in intellectual property? How can you patent your ideas? And I went to the lawyers and said, can I patent the sound of fear? I said, I don't believe in patenting genes, but people do it. And this is kind of the same thing, isn't it? They said, no, you have to make a box that identifies the sound of fear and you can patent that and sell it. I said, but, that, but a gene, I mean, come on. <laughs> Didn't work. So I haven't been able to patent the sound of fear. But is it really noise? So I've been wanting to put people in a tube and scare them for a while since we've done these experiments and look at functional MRI. And the predictions are that you know, certain sounds would um, activate the amygdala or parts of the brain of the amygdala, which is associated with fearful situations. Some people beat us to it, but they weren't looking at noise. And, and I, I have to say, the arc of my career would end nicely if I can put people in tubes and scare them with Marmot-inspired music. <laughs> but um, they were looking at roughness. Roughness is really rapid amplitude fluctuations, which kind of is correlated with noise and screams as well. Roughness occupies a special acoustic space. These aren't normal spectrograms. These are what are called modulation power spectrums. And this is a modulation power spectrum that illustrates a rough sound, and this is a, a non-rough sound. And that screams are rough. So they had people saying, oh my god, help me. And they had people screaming, oh my god, help me. And the scream effect looks very different than the sentence effect in these what are called modulation power spectrums. So it turns out that these rough sounds activate the amygdala specifically. As I said, they beat us to it. Um, we still want to look at noise and, and decompose noise from roughness. So there's something about screams. We know that there may be something about roughness in screams. I suspect there's also something about noise in screams. So I'm going to wrap up really quickly um, with um, some of the lessons we've been thinking about today. Marmot alarm calls communicate degree of risk, not predator type, by a variety of different mechanisms. Alarm calls can be individually distinctive. This distinctiveness allows receivers to assess caller reliability. Um, it's generally important to assess reliability, and I think it's really exciting. There are multiple ways of doing so. We need to now understand what are the ecological social conditions which select for one mechanism versus another. Um, screams contain nonlinearities. I think communicate fear and arousal, and that these fearful and emotionally evocative sounds can be characterized by noise and other nonlinear acoustic attributes. And, um, can double down on this because this knowledge can be profitable. So with that, I would like to thank you for staying a little late. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Looking forward to meeting more of you. and happy to try to answer any questions um, now if you have any. Thanks for coming. And I don't know if anyone has been doing that per se, although species do listen to other species screens, but not really looking at any so Susan Lingle has done stuff where she's played back screens from different species to other species.
but not in sort of communication that context. Good question. Yeah. Um, so for your first experiment, you rolled against the reliable and unreliable caller. Um, and just for clarity, you found that there was no difference in foraging, right? No, there was. They foraged more while hearing the reliable caller. So you would think they would forage less if they habituated to, right? Okay, right. Actually. So I'm wondering, like, so where did those calls come from? I'm wondering if, like, to them, they seemed both unreliable because it's just, like, this disembodied voice. Like, it's not a marmot that they, they yeah, know. Yeah, that's a good question. Seen. So first of all, um, all of our calls were from novel animals they never heard. And they were trained up with a whole bunch of these different calls. So it wasn't just one exemplar. It was a whole bunch from these novel animals. So it was other locations or other, you know, um, so they didn't know these calls, mm. but we found differences between how we could train them and what they learned from that. And what I think this shows is um, the way we did this experiment, it really allows us to infer something about these animals creating uh, a representation. I mean, these are the same techniques that people use to study preverbal children, um, that, that where we infer things about what representations they're creating. Um, so they're creating a representation of reliability um, based on what they've learned about one individual versus another. <clears throat> yeah? At one point in your talk, you mentioned briefly about uh, rhythmic structures and some of the sounds. I wonder if there's any patterns that came out of it, all of the things you've been doing that suggest this and might not work. So, Greg Bryant is really into the musical communication and emotion literature, and Peter was as well. And, I mean, there's a huge literature on music. Um, almost all of it is completely divorced from biological explanations. So people talk about, you know, some, um, uh, oh, geez, what's the word? Um, minor chords being, you know, scary. Well, why are minor chords scary? Well, they might be scary because controlling for frequency, it might have something else in it. Low frequency should be alarming. People talk about rhythmicity. There's the videos of the dancing cockatoos and some other things that, you know, can track beats. Um, I don't, I haven't been studying that. I don't know how to study that from the perspective I have. In fact, I don't know how to study other emotions. I think I can study fear because I think there's an enough of, there's enough innate signature of fear more than other things. Now, having said that, clearly joy or happiness or fun must be associated with dopamine. And there are many species that have Dopamine responses to things that you know cause secretions of dopamine, but I don't know how to study that. There's a huge social construct theory for emotions, and the people that believe in that also believe that you know fear is a social construct. But I think you can I think you can tap into more of the biology of that um, all species because it's so mission critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Go ahead, Michael. Oh, I, I was just wondering. Did, do marmots give alarm calls if conspecifics are not around in the presence of predators? Uh, they can. So yeah. And, and, and does it does it differ if there are conspecifics around? I don't think so. I don't know. My gut feeling is no. Um, so some species have very strong audience effects. So the the, the animals that typically call more are <coughs> mothers with pups around. Mm -hmm. So everyone calls at some low frequency, and then when pups come up. Mothers with pups above ground for early on are more likely to call. They're also pretty stressed out about that. At least the good mothers are more likely to call. Um, but at, you know the, the home range is big enough, the visibility is poor enough for the yellow-bellied marmots at least, um, that they often don't know who's around. Um, they might have some recollection of who they've been hanging out with. They probably know their position in the social network. We know that animals who are in have to occupy different positions in their social network, more isolated animals are more likely to call both in the trap and naturally. So knowledge of social relationships with others um, seems to potentially be calling as well. I, I was also confused about um, why they would forage more in, in the presence of reliable calls. And you, and you suggested that this was different from other species in which this has been studied. Why the difference? I think there's different mechanisms. I mean, they're trusting but verifying. They look up and around, nothing's there, I'll give you a, a, a free pass. I think understanding that difference really becomes an evolutionary ecology question, you know, which is what selects for mechanistic variation? Why do we see differences in the way information is processed? I think there's got to be something about the reliability of their environment or, or, or others that, that, that selects for that, as opposed to um, simply habituating to these and ignoring later on 
these, these less reliable individuals. But I think it comes down to um, if you don't know what's going on around you, if someone's unreliable, if someone lies to you all the time, you know, should you be more wary and spend you know, more time looking or should you spend less? Sort of depends on the value of that information. So I think there's something about the value of the information that um, makes them spend more independent effort figuring out what the true risk is after hearing something, after hearing something from a less reliable situation. I, th I think that's what it is. And the value of information is hard to study. And I think there might be some models that be done, be, can be done to look at this, and I think there might be more comparative studies that can be done in people. But again. the implication is that that value is different in different species. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can you distinguish foraging but wary from foraging and unconcerned? Great right question. Wary. Short answer, no. Maybe. Longer answer. Um, <laughs> let's just say no as we support it. Um, you know, so we're looking at total time foraging and rates of foraging, and it didn't really yeah. jump out. But they still have ears. They could be looking yeah. down, but they could be listening. Maybe they're allocating more attention to listening when they're foraging. I don't know. Yeah. So in all of the studies that, like in your work, the ones that you were <coughs> presenting, um, all of the, uh, all of them were using like predators that are recognizable to the animals that were being looked at. And I was wondering if anyone ever tried looking at how, um, what happens if you introduce novelty? So like something completely unfamiliar, either like an unfamiliar predator, unfamiliar sounds, like how do Great question. So we introduced novelty in a number of these experiments in various ways. One, using um, novel birds they never could hear mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a true novelty control as opposed to a non-threatening control. The, the problem with any playback experiment is you have an unlimited number of controls you could do. And you know these animals habituate to too many treatments. All of our studies are within individual studies to build power, but you give too many experiments to them, you burn them up. Um, and then we've looked at how they respond to predators they've never heard, seen, or smelled. And we were asking questions about, you know, what do they know about wolves after not having lived with wolves for um, 70 or 100 years? And the answer is they know the sound, the sight, and the smell of wolves. So we've looked at, you know, predator discrimination in all modalities. Yeah. And, and, and whereas other species that might have the evolutionary isolated from predators for a long time, Time, you know, might not have those sorts of abilities. So my work in Australia with uh, various marsupials is to try to figure out how buggered are you, um, you know, when you've lived on an island without predators for a long time, and that's the only population to bring back to the mainland where the animals have been extinct by foxes and cats, which are novel predators. Let's get Dan another round of applause. Thanks for